Hello, everyone. Welcome to my podcast again. Today, we have a communication expert. So this should be a very good interview, huh? <laughs> he is an author. He is also a speaker and an advocate for mental health. The first time I came across his work was watching his TED Talk, which happened, I believe, in 2011. Mm -hmm. And the story that he tells on this TED Talk was a story that I know will be of interest to you, my listener. His name is J.D. Schramm. He made sure that I pronounced it the German way, because that's the right way. I'm so <laughs> happy that you're here, J.D. Thank you so much for saying yes. Oh, Paula, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the work you do uh, mm -hmm. through your podcast to reach people on, on such an important topic. Yes, and it's a topic that you know well. I, I just, I think it was an interview that you gave or maybe something you wrote. You talked about a beloved teacher and a good friend that you lost to suicide not, not long ago. Yeah. So it's something that has touched you very, very deeply. Yeah, and it, it, um continues to touch all of us uh directly or indirectly but mm -hmm. certainly um we have seen through the COVID-19 uh requirements for shelter in place uh that the isolation that mm -hmm. everyone has gone through around the globe it's it's the first time we've had anything like this where globally we are all more separated from one another than ever before um, has also increased the uh, incidence of suicide and depression in some communities, you know, by, by as much as 30%. And so it's, it's, um, it is a challenge that we have with us, but it's, it's particularly mm -hmm. in focus, I think, right now with what we're going through as a globe. Yes. And the other way that you know about suicide also is because you yourself attempted once. And that's the story you, you tell on your TED Talk. And according to what you say, it was the first time you actually talked about it publicly. So, JD, what I want for us to do today, and it's something that I try to, what I try to do with this podcast is one of the things that I do is to try to help people understand what goes on in, in not just the person's life when they attempt a suicide, but especially in their hearts, in their minds, their mental health, the way of thinking, you know, all the constriction that we know goes on, because I think it helps at least fight the stigma and also all the misconceptions we have about, about someone who goes through an experience like that. As you know, I lost my father to suicide. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, to me, it's an insult. Every time I read somewhere or I hear someone say, that's the coward's way out. Every time I hear that, no, I need to find somebody else to make it clear to people that no, it's about unbearable pain and it's about hopelessness. So tell us what was going on in your life and what led you to the suicide attempt. Certainly, certainly, Paula. Um, I, uh, the attempt that I share in the TED Talk uh, was June of 2003. Mm -hmm. and, and I will answer your question about that attempt. But what I don't share in the TED Talk is that that was at least my third or fourth attempt at wow. ending my life. Uh, the earliest uh, that I can recall, I was in the seventh grade, 1977. Um, I had another serious attempt in 1981 when I was in high school, um, and then another one um, uh, early in my 20s, uh, and multiple other times where suicide felt like it was an option. And it was, it was an option that was on the table among other choices. And um, in terms of your exact question, what was, what was going through my mind? Uh, and, and as I share my story with your listeners and your viewers, I want to emphasize, this is my story. This is my journey. This is one man's experience. Uh, and listen for what might be similar rather than discarding what's different. Yes. Um, 
in my case, my depression was very much wrapped up with my addiction. Uh, and so I had a um, several decades long addiction with drugs and alcohol that I had tried from 13 to 38 to get on the other side of and um, would go three months, maybe six months, maybe 30 days. And then I would slip and I would drink or I would use drugs again. And the incidents leading up to my suicide attempt in June of 2003 included slips with both alcohol and drugs and just a, a feeling of, of worthlessness and hopelessness that everybody else in, in the rooms of, of recovery seemed to be getting it and, and I wasn't. And I felt like I just was never going to get on the other side of it. And so that was part of the mental um, uh, belief system that, that led to my attempt. But then I was treating that, I was self-medicating that with drugs and alcohol, which are in themselves a depressant. And so it's like, you know, taking the exact wrong medicine to get a much worse outcome. And so um, uh, June 11th, uh, the, the day of my attempt, um, I, I felt like I just was never going to get to the other side of my addiction and my depression and um, feeling as you described with your own father, so much pain that the only way out was to end the pain. And the only way I could see to end the pain was to end my life. Mm -hmm. I was wrong, but in the fog of my addiction and depression, that's the pathway that I thought was available. And each day I'm grateful that I failed. Yeah. JD, tell me, because uh, uh, the more I hear stories, there are so many of them that are intertwined with addiction, uh, especially alcohol. I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, again, they self-medicate. And as you said, it creates this cycle, right? That you, you get more depressed because of the alcohol, because alcohol numbs a little bit in the beginning, but after a while, <clears throat> you go down this black hole again, and it just feeds the depression. Tell me a little bit more about uh, that addiction phase of your life. Had, what had you tried that was not working? So my, um, I grew up in an alcoholic family. My father was in recovery almost my whole life. I think I was six years old when uh, dad quit drinking um, right after Christmas one year. Um, and so I, I had grown up around the rooms of recovery, but my father was an alcoholic, my grandmother, one of my aunts. Um, there was a lot of genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. to alcoholism in my family. And I uh, grew up um, in, in a small town in Western Kansas. And as a gay kid in the closet, growing up in a, in a community that didn't support my uh, sexual orientation, there was a lot of inner conflict, um, uh, both with my Roman Catholic faith and with my upbringing and, and with my identity. And so even at, at the age of 13, I was seeing alcohol as a release or a, a, a way to cover, a way to hide, a way to feel better about myself. And when I first started drinking, I drank alcoholically. Like some people, their first mm -hmm. drink, they, they, oh, I you hate did, the taste You didn't of that. progress. You didn't progress yeah. into it. You went straight into addiction. Yeah. First time I drank, I got drunk and I sought out opportunities to drink heavily. Um, and so it was easier to tell my parents that I was an alcoholic than it was to tell them that I was gay. And so at, at 13 or 14, I actually started going to teen AA meetings. Um, but it never, it never stuck. I never really gave in to what was available in the rooms of recovery. And what, what happened in my situation is as I progressed for the next 25 years, my addiction just got stronger and stronger and stronger. And so, um, you know, I moved from beer to, to liquor, to 
harder alcohol, um, stronger drinks, less of a mix. Um, and in 1997, um, I went to rehab for the first time. And even coming out of rehab, I, I didn't stay sober more than a few months. And the next six years from 97 to 2003, I, I seriously increased my amount of drugs in addition to the alcohol continually looking for something that could get me more in oblivion, get higher, feel less about my problems. And that escape mechanism finally just completely stopped working for me. Um, but it, um, it, it definitely progressed deeper and, and harder the older that I got until I ultimately was able uh, to get on the other side of it and surrender. Mm -hmm. Did you have history of suicide in your family? I don't believe so. Um, no, I, I can't. I can't think of anyone within the, the close family. Uh, yeah. that, that but it, it's it's good that you say uh, I don't believe so because we never know, do we? Yeah. So many yeah. times we only find out, you know through conversations and it was a secret and nobody ever talked about that's that's how suicide runs in families and generations right in silence exactly and in fact the the ted talk that that you referenced um i, I chose the title breaking the silence mm -hmm. because um we are so programmed to not talk about suicide and depression and and to hold these things close and the more that we do that, the more that we keep a, a shame cycle alive, the more that we keep this um, taboo subject, um, the, the, the less we can break through and reach people to say, no, this, this actually isn't uh, an option that should be on the table. Um, there are other choices than, than suicide. How was the reaction after that TED talk of your friends and family? Did they know? Had you had you warned them that you're going to do it? Um, uh, my my husband knew that I was going to do it, and a couple of close friends. And um, I I did it at a, a TED event, but uh, it was there was maybe two or three hundred people in the audience and. It was a simulcast of the actual TED conference in Long Beach. And I got immediate positive response from the people who saw the talk. It was at the beginning of the week. So throughout the week, I kept interacting with people who had seen it and wanted to talk about depression or suicide in their own family. But then when the week was over and the TED organization wanted to put it up online, I was like, no, I am not ready to have the whole world know this story. And I took three months to decide. Really? Was, I didn't know that they give you time. Uh, to... uh, they did for me because of the, okay. the, the weight of the, the content. Subject. Yeah. And uh, Chris Anderson, the, the, uh, the head of TED, uh, he and I even had some, some personal email exchanges about it. And he said, you need to decide if you're ready. And when you are, wow, that's great. we think it would make a difference. And if the choice is yours. And during that three month period of time, I lost one more friend to suicide, a, um, a friend I had gone to high school with. And I thought, you know, if, if the title of the talk is breaking the silence and Ted wants to put it up online, what better way to break the silence? And we chose to put it up. Um, at the time, I was on the faculty at Stanford's Business School, and we chose to put it up on June 11th, which was the eight year anniversary of my my attempt but the beauty of that choice was it it brought light and hope and something positive to celebrate about june 11th and it also ended up being at the end of the school year and so i didn't have to walk into class on monday and have my whole class having having seen it because yeah. i wasn't sure what that would be like and i had the summer to get used to people stopping me, telling me they'd seen the talk and shared it in emails. And by the time school started in the fall, it wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah. And I was more comfortable uh, having the talk out there. Gave you, gave you time to acclimate, right? To the reactions, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, JD, I'd like that you say on your TED talk that, as you just said, I, I wanted, I needed to break my own silence. And you also say my own taboos. So what were the taboos? Did you mean taboos about suicide or taboos about mental health and sexual orientation, all of that together? Yeah, it, it, um, I think plural is correct, Paula. I think it is taboos. And, and I think for me, it was as a young person, certainly the, my sexual orientation uh, coming out as gay um, and growing up in a, in a Roman Catholic family. And actually I still um, am Roman Catholic and I'm part of a, a very gay friendly Catholic parish in San Francisco. Um, but I think that was probably the, the first taboo. And then owning my, my addiction and um, to drugs and alcohol um, and the, you know, there are some people who can talk about addiction and it sounds very glamorous. My addiction was not glamorous. Like at the very end, I was using crack cocaine mm -hmm. in, uh, in a, um, in an apartment that I didn't have rights to be in, uh, that, you know, I, I was, there was nothing pretty or cosmopolitan about my drug and alcohol use at the end. And even just saying, you know, a drug addiction versus crack cocaine, like, like the, the, yeah. the, the reality of that image. And then, you know, the suicide attempt um, that, you know, I nearly ended my life. Um, you know, I, I uh, um, but your viewers will, will have probably already seen the TED talk or they're going to go see it shortly, but I'm one of the few people who has jumped from the Manhattan bridge and lived, um, what the police told my family after I was rescued and taken to Bellevue hospital was that, you know, many people may survive the fall, but then they drowned in the water because of the injuries to their body. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I lived for, we're not sure two or three hours. Um, floating in the water, in and out of consciousness, floated under the Brooklyn Bridge, out it's unbelievable, yeah. into the path of the Staten Island Ferry. And it was actually people on the Staten Island Ferry that could hear my screams that told the ferry boat driver who contacted the Coast Guard, who sent a, a water ambulance out to find me in the water dark late at night. So it's, it's a miracle that I'm here. And I had to deal with my own, first of all, my physical recovery and then my mental and my spiritual recovery. Um, it was um, eight years between the attempt and the TED talk. And I don't think it would have been healthy for me, certainly in the first two or three years to be that public about it. Now, mm -hmm. some other people may be able to do that. I needed to have both feet firmly on ground and, and clearly stepping into a life that, yeah. that I was able to share the journey that I had been on. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that journey, JD, because uh, I, I have a, an online course on how to help suicidal people. In one of the, the modules, I talk about um, risk factors and how we have to be really careful when we d determine and look at risk factors. And one of the examples I give is a, is a suicide attempt, which is on the list of, of, of uh, risk factors on the top of the list. That's the number one. Yes. Yeah, as you know. But for some people, it's actually a protective factor like it was for you. After an attempt, you realize what you almost just la uh, just lost because you you survived, thankfully, and then it completely changes your life, and that's what it did to you. And that's the takeaway that I want to give my listeners. So tell me about this process of realizing what you had done, and as you said, it wasn't the first time, but it was maybe the most lethal one that you tried. Mm -hmm. But then realizing have to go because you you had a lot of injuries. You have you had to grow through you know recovering your body and everything. Tell me about that and that how that actually saved your life. Um, absolutely, Paula, and I will I will preface it by saying everything that I did after the suicide attempt 
I could have done without the suicide attempt. Like it wasn't necessary to go as far as I went. And I would urge your viewers and the people in your online class um, to recognize that this is not a step you ever have to take. But if you make the mistake and you, you've made an attempt, there is um, a great possibility of you coming back to a life that is full and rich and, and a blessing to you. For me, um, you know, it's kind of the triage model. The very first thing was the physical injuries. I was in uh, Bellevue Hospital for uh, 23 days, most of it in the ICU. The very final week I was in the psych ward um, because of the suicide attempt. And to be sure that I had a, um, a healthy plan after exiting the hospital. And, um, uh, and I, I got out on the 4th of July, uh, kind of a fun way to celebrate Independence Day. And I left Bellevue in the morning and I checked into uh, Valley Hope uh, Drug and Alcohol Rehab Center that evening. And then I started, so once the physical healing had mostly been done, I started the um, uh, healing work around my addiction. And so the next 28 days, I was in uh, Valley Hope and um, you know, learned more about, about recovery and about the tools that I could be using to stay sober. And then I left there and I had jail time that I had to serve. I had uh, received my third DUI while I was in Kansas in May. And, um, and I had to uh, go to court and accept the sentence of, of spending time in jail. And so I, I had to then, I'd handled the physical, started to handle the addiction, needed to handle the legal aspect. And then the very last thing that I did is I was able to spend a month in a retreat house in the mountains of Colorado. And I was able to really start focusing on the spiritual aspects of my journey. And so when I did return to New York in November of 2003, I came back to New York with about six months of sobriety and with the tools of, of spiritual um, and, and um, emotional and physical, and even in my case, financial recovery, that I had a really good shot at making it. And then when I was in New York, I, I had sold my apartment in the East Village. I moved out to a, a roommate share uh, way out in Brooklyn. Um, and I, I got away from you know, the trappings of big city. And I really, I, I, I had a, a, a job that I loved. Um, I led a very simple life. I went to um, recovery meetings on a regular basis. I had a therapist. I had, for the first year, I had a psychiatrist. I was still on antidepressants. And I just put myself in the hands of the experts and I trusted them. One of the definitions that I learned of surrender, it's not throwing in the towel, it's not giving up, it's not admitting defeat. Surrender is putting yourself in the care of those who are winning. And that distinction, like something clicked for me. I was like, oh, I've been trying to care for myself and I've screwed it up. I'm gonna put myself in the hands of those who are winning. And I took their advice, I listened. Uh, I went the first three years of sobriety without dating. Um, I, I really slowed my life down and put my mental health and my recovery first. And by putting that front and center, I then could start layering things back on like a romantic relationship. I ultimately got engaged and got married. He and I now have a family. Um, I do have, you know, have been able to repair my credit to a place that we could buy a home. And, but I did all of those things slowly. I didn't rush into them the first year or two after the attempt. And I think that long, slow recovery, that understanding of surrender and, and being patient with myself was, was a key to really experiencing the turnaround from the attempt and not continuing on that cycle of another fall, another slip, another attempt. 
What do you, because what I'm thinking now you're telling about this and, and then after this question, I want to go into some of the suggestions or tips, whatever you want to call it, that you give to people who go through an attempt and how to find recovery and how to build a meaningful life mainly. But I'm thinking here, uh, okay, so he decided to rebuild his life, to reframe his life. But was there a moment when you this was it when you woke up in the hospital and said, "Why on earth did I do this? I I need to find another another way for my life," or was it something that slowly with, with medication and all this treatment? Then because if you go if you went to the Colorado retreat, it's because you're already searching for that, right? So yeah. something in your mind had already changed. So do you identify a moment when you said, "Wow"? something needs to be different from now on because some people just go ahead and make another attempt right yeah um that's a wonderful question paula um i think there are two moments that spring to mind uh, one is the moment i hit the water in that in that leap i um I heard a voice or I heard a voice inside my head, but, but the thought that came to me was, it doesn't have to end this way. Mm. It doesn't have to end this way. And while I had shattered my right arm and I broken all my ribs, I'd punctured my lung, I'd injured my, my, my legs, my left arm was still good and I could stay above water. I could paddle back up to the surface and stay above water and start screaming for help. And so there was that moment where it doesn't have to end this way. And then once I was rescued and I was in the hospital, my family was flying to New York to be with me. Um, then I was really embarrassed. I did not want to see them. I wished I'd have succeeded. I, yeah. I went back into several days of, of um, depressive, I was on suicide watch in the hospital. I was never left alone because I, I wished I would have succeeded. But somehow in those first two weeks at Bellevue, a light turned back on and my will to live came back to me. And how I know that it happened is I started journaling again. There had been like a, 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 a two or three week period. I'd been journaling the day of my attempt and there were notes in my journal to people, uh, farewell letters to people that were in my journal. And then there was nothing for almost two weeks. And when I asked for my journal and a pen and I started journaling again, that's when my will to live started to come back to me. And it was, it was like a small flame that then became a candle and then became bright enough you could see by. Um, but it, it was slow, but it, it was there and I was able to, to nurture it in that regard. Um, so that was, those are the, the two moments that I can think of. And I didn't know this at the time, but there were hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, many of whom I didn't know that were praying for me, that my sister and, and my two sisters and friends had started this circle of emails out to people that, that I had done this and, and the prayer was pray that his will to live returns and my will to live did return yeah. and I've had to nurture it and take care of it ever since, but it is still there and it's strong. It's a great prayer though, because <clears throat> it's not pray for him to live, right? But for him to want to live and to want to yeah. build something out of his life. Yeah. The other day, I heard one of the one of the most heartbreaking stories I, I've heard in the last few months, and it was after COVID. This happened like two months ago. A friend of mine called me from Brazil. <clears throat> His daughter had died uh, of suicide, a mm -hmm. uh, teenager. And he, after a few days of his death, his mom, her mom wrote like a letter, um, and she actually shared that when she was in the hospital with her daughter, she whispered in her ear, she said, only come back if you regret it. Mm. Can you imagine for a mom to say something like that? It just, 
it's it's hard for for a story today to just kind of paralyze me but that one did for a mom to say to be in that much pain but still tell her daughter don't come back if it's for you to do it again but that's not what she said she said only come back to us if you regret it because mm. that yeah it's very painful but it's kind of what you your sister did right let's yeah. pray that he regains the will to live yeah it's very different to just be alive um you know paul i wasn't expecting to do this but um i'd like to read something if i can of course yeah um no this was not written at the time i actually wrote this this summer um or this uh, a year ago but um I had never, um, I, I don't consider myself a poet. I've, I've written books, I've, I've written blogs and, and columns and essays and stuff like that. Um, but I took a poetry workshop um, uh, in the fall of 2020 and um, we were given the prompt to, uh, the leader asked us to consider an event in our life that was troubling that we now had greater power around and to write a poem about that. And this is what I created. My leap of no faith. That warm June night, I nearly died, but God had more for me in mind. As I looked at dark water far below, I felt inside there was only down to go. I was so wrong. People, strangers to me, were more committed to my life than I was. Ferry riders, the boat captain, the Coast Guard, the EMTs, unknown to each other, conspired to save me from myself. That warm June night, I nearly died, but God had more for me in mind. Bellevue enveloped me, working with speed and expertise. My family was phoned, ending hours of fear and confusion. Within a day, Dad and Kathy were at my side, of which I was truly terrified. ICU gave way to acute care, to regular care, to the psych ward. Dad never missed a visit through my 23 day stay. That warm June night, I nearly died, but God had more for me in mind. Slowly, my will to live did return. First a flicker, then a flame did burn. My body recovered quickly. My mind and soul took more time. Years later, I now bless the day I failed in my attempt. My sister, the poet, captured it well. June 11 was the end of a chapter, but not the end of the book. That warm June night, I nearly died, but God had more for me in mind. Thank you for sharing. It's beautiful. Yeah, it, it just, it, it felt like it captured what we were just talking about. Yeah. And, and um, I recognize everyone who's hearing this or seeing this, all of our faith journeys and our life journeys are very different. But um, there is a good out there mm. that is stronger <clears throat> than the bad. And, and whether, whether that for you, that's you know, the universe or that's nature or that's God mm -hmm. or that's Allah mm -hmm. or, or Jehovah, um, th there is a good out there that's stronger. And we, we have to find ways to embrace it, to trust it, to uh, mm -hmm. re-engage with it. And, and for me, um, yeah, every day I'm blessed to be here. And um, if sharing my story or offering help or tips to other people is useful, yeah. um, I'm, I'm privileged to get to do it. When I, and I'm privileged to have you here. So let's give them those tips, things that you learn throughout your journey. One, one of the tips that you give that caught my attention was, and you already mentioned this in the beginning, but very quickly, but I wanted to go more deeply into it, is live simply. Why is that important? Um, it, it really is uh, getting back to uh, what's essential. And when we 
um, are really trying to focus on recovering our, our, our life and our, our mindset and our soul, um, when, when we, when we want to have that focus there, the less we distract ourselves mm -hmm. with high paying jobs and great trips and, and uh, big expenditures, the more that we just focus on that which is necessary to live. Um, uh, somewhere else I've, I've, I've said, you know, I had the trappings of, a, of an amazing life in, in Manhattan, but they're called trappings because they trap you. <laughs> Um, yes, they do. You know, yeah. and, they become and, a prison. Yeah. Yeah. And so being able to live simply, um, uh, debt free, not living on credit cards, making enough to cover cover my expenses, that that simplicity was really a key to figuring out what was most important to me, and 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 then stepping into that. Uh, and it's not to say you can't ultimately have those things again, but with greater um, integrity and care and intention uh, right yeah. yeah the last uh, guest I had on, on my podcast he was talking about this because he was very rich all he cared about was making money and he had a lot of it and he actually mentions that he had in his house in the living room the largest tv he could buy <laughs> never turned it on didn't know how to turn it on that's how much of a trap it becomes, right? But he had to have the most expensive TV that he had to ask his daughter to, to just show him, how do I make this work? Because <laughs> one day he finally decided to watch TV because he didn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but the ex, but it, it, yeah, it raises your expectations. And like yeah. most things in life, like drugs, as you mentioned, the more you have, the more you need, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. nothing, nothing is ever good enough. It's There's never, never enough. enough. There's, There's never, never enough. enough. Yeah. Okay, second one, you talk about cultivate sacred spaces. Mm. What does that mean? You know, just having a, a place, it can, a physical place, either in your home, if that's possible, um, or, um, you know, a, 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 a coffee shop that you go to, a chapel that you visit, a um, a bench in the park that you go to, but a place that you go that you know this is your place to commune with God, to meditate, to reflect, to journal. Um, uh, it it there there's a value in having a space that you know you have dedicated it to that purpose, and it it. it Again, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a huge house that you have a, a, a with meditation a huge TV. chamber in. With a huge yeah, TV. With a huge TV. <laughs> um, uh, it literally could be, you know, a, a park bench. Um, and, and having those places that you can, that you can go to and you know when you go there, you're free to go within. And, and I think that's, that's the beauty of the sacred space. Okay. I, there is one that I love personally because I identified with it. Create works of beauty. Mm -hmm. I'm a crafter. I do a lot of them. I am always involved in many different art projects and things like that. So I know the value it has. But tell me the value that it had for you. Yeah, well, and the, the poem I just shared is an example of that. I don't consider <laughs> myself a poet, but yeah. um, you know, putting my writing skills into a new place. Um, for me, it was, uh, it was journaling. Um, uh, I do collages. I don't paint or draw very well. And so, um, but, but just having something that you're able to create and look back at it and go, ah, I made that, you know, and it doesn't have to be for anyone else to see, but it allows you um, to tap into that, that right brain, that creative energy Mm -hmm. uh, and see what you're able to produce. Um, yeah. you know, it, and so many people say, but I don't have any talent. You don't know. Talent and talent doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just that you're allowing your physical body to express things creatively. Yeah. And however that shows up. Yeah, you mentioned collage. I don't know if you can see behind me the collages. For oh, those yes. who are watching the videos, let me, 
Let me move the camera here. Maybe you can see better. Oh, I love those. Yeah. See? Those are all collages made by Bill Welter. He's my boyfriend. He's a great collage <laughs> artist. Uh, and I actually just changed this background because I wanted to have his collage behind me because it's beautiful <laughs> and very creative. Lovely. Yeah. So create works of beauty. Let me find another one that I love. Oh, I've, I, this one's kind of, when I read it, I said, oh, why is that? That could be good, but no. Avoid dating. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me and for many people in recovery, that first year, is crucial that you work on yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I would date, I would often stop working on myself and try to focus on the other person. What's going to impress him? What's he going to like? What's he going to not like? And, um, and I needed to be comfortable with me first. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken, the man that, that I met and ultimately, ultimately married, he and I met in August of 2003, but we didn't go on a date until July of 2006, three wow. years after both of us had had entered recovery. And, and by not dating and not being in a romantic relationship until I'd done my own work first, I was then in a place I could more fully share myself with someone else. Mm -hmm. I also found in, in my experience, I Except for Ken, I didn't really pick good boyfriends. And so often the breakups were ugly and I would want to drink and use or I would be depressed in the breakup. So why even go into the relationship until you're ready to, to have something that you're mm -hmm. proud of being able to share with somebody? Yeah. And speaking now, of share, oh, sorry, go on. But let me, <laughs> let me add to that, huh. that um, uh, it's not to say you don't want to have intimate, connected, um, you know, friendships and relationships with people. I think you need to have a, a, a circle of trusted friends that you can share fully and you can be um, candid about what you're going through and what's going on. Um, but my advice is don't move into the romantic relationships until you've done the healing work on yourself that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you just mentioned what I wanted to explore too. You say share selectively, so be very careful. So let's let's jump into the last one, which is related to relationships, right? You say assemble your dream team. And there is another one that has to do with, let me see. Uh, you have two that has to do with relationships. I mean, be selective with relationship with whom yeah. you share your story, but also have people who are willing to really support and, and help you through the journey. Yeah. And, um, and again, I'm going to go back to the definition I gave earlier about surrender. Surrender is putting yourself in the care of the winners, putting yourself in the care of those who are winning. For me, my dream team included um, my pastor um, mm -hmm. for um, spiritual guidance and spiritual development, um, my sponsor in recovery, um, my therapist who uh, finding a good therapist and, and being completely honest with a therapist was crucial. Um, for that first year, I also had a, a physician attending to my medical issues, but also the, the psychiatric meds that I was on or the, the antidepressants that I was on. Um, and then my CPA, because I had a lot of um, debt and financial mess that I needed to clean up. And, uh, and I guess I could add to that my lawyer, because I, I had uh, the jail time that I had to serve. Mm -hmm. But they didn't all have to know each other. But they were, for me, the team of winners that I put myself in their care. I listened to what they said. Uh, my sister, Kathy became a big part of that dream team for me, uh, helping me uh, manage and recover. But but she couldn't be the therapist or be- uh, Yeah, they the all sponsor. have their place, right? They all have their, their role. role. And as I got stronger and stronger, soon, you know, the debt wasn't an issue. I was no longer on antidepressants. You know, now I'm 18 years past the attempt. Um, I'm, I still go to- 
um, uh, recovery meetings. I still have a therapist. I still have a sponsor. And so um, you keep in place the members of the dream team that you need. Uh, and at times you may need to cycle people out and yeah. have someone else join your dream team. But the main thing is don't think you can do it alone. Right? Don't think you can do it alone. Um, I heard it said one time uh, that our minds are like a really bad neighborhood. We shouldn't go in there all by ourselves. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, JD, let's talk about, I know you're writing a wonderful book that's coming up. Uh, I will make sure that when it does, I'll have the link uh, on my notes and yes. I will have the link of this article that you wrote with the tips because there are some wonderful tips there and I want my listeners to find all of them. But tell us about the book. So what's happening there? You bet. Um, so this has been my, my COVID project. Um, a lot of people who have seen the TED Talk have said, oh my gosh, you really need to write a book. Uh, and so that is, um, uh, that is one of the things I was able to work on with the extra time in COVID. So um, uh, the draft is, is about 100 pages. Uh, the working title right now is uh, The Bridge Back to Life, mm -hmm. My Journey from the Edge of Death to the Center of Life. And I, in writing it, it's been cathartic to, to capture things, to go back through journals and medical records and, and uh, talk to members of my family and, and people about you know, their experience but, uh, of, of my attempt. But I've also come to realize that I'm not defined by my failed suicide attempt. Yes, I, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and mm -hmm. I am happy to help other people avoid the mistake that I made, but it's not June 11th that defines me and the leap from the Manhattan Bridge, of course. everything I've done since then. And so what I've tried to do in the book is share my journey, other trips, other falls, recovery from those, but mm -hmm. to give people um, a memoir of what one person went through, mm -hmm. but also a, a roadmap <clears throat> or a checklist of, of steps or actions they could mm -hmm. take in their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I really do believe that we all deserve to live the life of our dreams and that we are allowed to, to have those dreams and take actions to fulfill on them. Yeah. And, and if I can support people in doing that, whether or not they've had a suicide attempt or they've struggled with depression or struggled with coming out, um, I, I want my life to make a difference in allowing other people to, to live the life of their dreams as well. Well, JD, I hope that by writing your book and looking back, because it's great that you're writing now after so many years, I hope that you looked at yourself and you felt proud and you would say, wow, I did all this. I made it. I do. I do. Good. And I thank you for that. Good, you. good good for you because it is amazing what you've done and what you still you still do thank you for being here with us have a good day uh, in california <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and uh i really appreciate uh just the chance to have this conversation with you today thanks sure. paula thank you mm -hmm.